Great to be with you. Um, I love that. I love that picture of Val dancing in heaven, having a party in heaven. It's like, it's an amazing thought, isn't it? It's an amazing picture. And I was just, if I may, to share a, <laughs> a quick memory. Um, I was reminded of this during the worship time. Maybe I should have been more focused on Jesus, but um, it was 24 years ago. Uh, Val was working in the church office up there, and I was a, a naive and foolish young man uh, doing an internship with the church, and I thought it would be hilarious to change the language on Val's phone to Greek. <laughs> Val didn't think it was... She didn't share my humour. She didn't think that was hilarious. And it, all the more when I realised that this is now in the Greek alphabet, which I can't read, and I don't know how to turn it back. <laughs> and uh, I got a look, which Derek will know very well, uh, that was a mixture of lots of emotions, disapproval, a bit of anger... But the thing with Val, she never stayed angry with you for very long at all. <laughs> she uh, forgave me very quickly, so I'm grateful for that. But um, we will really, really miss, really miss Val. Um, we're, we're in this series on generosity, and today, as you can see, it's Generosity and Wealth Part 2. That's because there was a Part 1 last week. Rich spoke brilliantly on this, focusing on the dangers of money. Uh, you know, how money can be such a trap for the human heart, and you know, it's a, it, it makes a good servant, but a terrible master, a terrible God. And, um, and he spoke about the joy of generosity, just the sheer joy that comes actually with generosity, and that's how God has, has made it. And so if you didn't hear that preached last week from Rich, do take some time to listen to it. It's well worth listening. Uh, and today's part two, and of course this is part of a, a wider series on generosity in all areas of life. So gospel-driven generosity, a radical generosity of heart that comes from being so filled with God's radical and lavish generosity and grace towards us, being so filled with his grace that you can't help but overflow with generosity in every area of life. So in your relationships, with forgiveness, in hospitality, in your use of gifts and talents, in your use of time, in your use of money and possessions, all areas of life. So first it comes out of this overflow of what we have received. It's not something we can kind of manufacture or make up ourselves, but having said that, there are practical responses to be made as well. Because if we just wait for that feeling of, oh, now I've received, so now I can give out, no, we're also commanded to be generous, regardless of how we're feeling. And so there are practical responses which actually do lead us more into God's grace and his generosity. So, for example, Stuart spoke about forgiveness, and obviously the practical response there is to forgive. If there's someone you need to forgive, you forgive, you do it. And you know that we forgive others first as a response to the forgiveness of God for us. The only reason we can forgive other people truly from the heart is because we understand that the extent of God's forgiveness for us is so great that we can never outgive him, we can never outforgive him. And so we do that, but also forgiveness is a step of faith. And we stretch ourselves as we take that step of faith in actually doing it, not waiting for the feeling to forgive, because that will never come. But in the process of doing it, you gain an even greater appreciation and revelation of God's forgiveness for us. So it's both receiving, but it's also doing, and then receiving as a result of that. So there are practical responses to be made here. I think it's really important that we're not just listening, hearing the word, and then not doing what it says, because that, Jesus said, that's a foolish builder who does that. That's like the builder who builds on the sand. We have to hear the word of the Lord and do it. Obey him. Do what he says. So when we talk about forgiveness, the practical response is to forgive. When Addy talked about hospitality, the practical response is to be more hospitable. And when we talk about generosity and money, the practical response is to give. And it's to give more and to stretch ourselves in that, to take a step of faith. Uh, Richard just mentioned gift day. That is obviously one opportunity we have uh, to, to do that. But I just want to be really, really clear about something. You know, Preaching on this theme over the last couple of weeks is not some cynical ploy to just boost this one gift day, boost the amount that we can raise at this one gift day, because we're talking about a lifestyle of generosity. So what this is about, it's about our hearts, a lifestyle, a heart of generosity that goes way beyond a gift day. This should affect the whole of our lives for the rest of our lives. So, generosity and wealth, part two. I'm gonna, we're going to look at probably one of the most confusing parables Jesus told, so this is going to be great fun. Um, in Luke chapter 16, it's the parable of the shrewd manager. So um, let me read this out for us, and then I'll try and explain how this relates to our use of money. So chapter 16, Luke 16 from verse 1. Jesus told his disciples 
there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, well, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. It's been kind of decimalized on on the screen. 3,000 litres. 800 gallons of olive oil. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, make it 400. He halved the amount. And he said to the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill, make it 800. Now the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Right, so what's going on in this story? It's a little bit confusing. Well, first of all, we have this rich man and his manager. And the job of the manager, the role of the manager was an important role, high responsibility. He had the responsibility of managing basically the whole estate, all the operations of that estate, including investing the rich man's money, handling his, his money. Now, it seems he hasn't been doing a very good job because the, the, the rich man, the master, he has heard some rumours about him, of him wasting his possessions, and he's going to fire him. He wants to fire this manager. This is bad news, obviously, for the manager, but especially bad news because he suddenly realises, if I lose my job here, I've got nowhere to go. I, I, have, I have nothing. He doesn't have any good relationships with people. He, he doesn't have any future job prospects or jobs that he's willing to do, at least. There's no welfare state. So if he loses his job, he will end up on the streets. And so he comes up with this plan of trying to gain favour with people, to build good relationships with people by knocking huge amounts off the loans that they owe his master. So that when he is fired, if he's fired, there's a hope that someone will remember him because he showed them favour and kindness. A hope that someone might welcome him in. There might be the possibility of a job with one of these people in the future. That's all quite straightforward, but I guess the confusion comes with, with, with where we see that the master commends his actions. Why would he do that? Why would he commend this man for knocking huge amounts off what he is owed? The rich man is owed this money. Why would he commend his manager for reducing the amount he receives back? There's some conjecture about that, but what it seems likely that was going on is that the manager had added some interest of his own, his own cut, his own commission to these loans. And now in the Jewish law, it was forbidden to lend money and add interest. That was forbidden because you lent money to help people out who were in need. You didn't lend money to profit out of them. That was understood in the Jewish law. But the way round that that they often found was to not lend money but to lend commodities like olive oil and wheat and then charge interest on that instead so it's very much the letter of the law but certainly not the spirit of the law now of course it could be that it's the rich man who's added this interest it could be him who's saying well I'm lending this I, I want to get my cut back that's possible but given that the manager is described as a dishonest manager and he's a bit of a shady character it seems likely that it was probably the manager himself making a bit of profit for himself charging interest on top of these loans so it's possible that what the manager is doing in reducing the repayment amount, he's simply cutting out his own commission. So the rich man still receives back what he should. He still receives back what he is expecting. And in the meantime, the manager is hoping to gain favour and goodwill with others in the process. And so that's why he's commended. The master commends the manager for his shrewdness, 
He admires it. He said, actually, that, that's smart. That's really smart. He, is, he, he commends him for his foresight in looking to provide for his future. He's impressed by that. So Jesus, in this parable, is using the example of a man who is clever and shrewd in a secular framework to teach his people, because it says Jesus told his disciples, this is him speaking to his followers, not to the general crowds. He's using this man and his example to teach his people, his followers, about how to use money in the kingdom of God. And we know this parable is about money ultimately because it's what Jesus says at the end. That's his punchline, that's his conclusion, that I've just told you all this, therefore you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus tells us that's what I'm talking about. This is all about how we use money. So, I'm going to try and draw out a couple of main points. Having set that context, try and draw out a couple of main points from this parable to do with how we use money in the kingdom of God. The first point is this. We are stewards of money that isn't ours. We are stewards of money that isn't ours. Jesus is likening his followers, he's likening us to this manager in the story. He has been put in charge of investing money that isn't actually his. Therefore, he has the responsibility to use this money in line with the values and the wishes of the one whose money it actually is, the owner, the rich man. The money belongs to the rich man, to his master. So this manager mustn't treat the money recklessly, and he mustn't treat it as if it's his own, because it's not. But actually, this is true for every one of us, if we believe what the Bible teaches us. This is true for every one of us. Everything you have is God's. It's all God's money. You are the steward responsible to him, to God, for how you use whatever you've been given. And some have been given much and some have been given less. But whatever you've been given, you have a responsibility to God for how you use it. They really understood this in the early church. They really got this principle. So in Acts 4, it tells us that no one, none of these early believers claimed that any of his possessions were his own. But they shared everything they had. They got it. They, they, these are not our possessions. We're willing to sell them to, to give to one another, to give to the poor. It tells us in Acts 4 that no one among them was in need, which is stunning, isn't it? And it was a stunning witness to the world around them. They looked at this community of people. No one among them is in need because they look after one another. They're willing to sell their possessions. They're even willing to sell land, and land in their context was a huge thing, a family uh, thing. You know, to sell land, that's massive. They're willing to do it. They really understood the principle of ownership, who, whose it actually was, and they were generous. They were open-handed. We, it's so vital that we get this right. It's so vital we understand ownership, whose it is, because if we don't get that right, we won't be generous with money and possessions. We won't get that right, because there is a self-centeredness within every human heart. We know it's there. Uh, You don't have to teach young children to say the word mine, but they do very quickly and very often. But I don't think we really grow out of it either. Mine, it's mine. We would tend to look at it and think, well, that's my money. I earned it. I I worked really hard for that money. And God would say, yeah, I I agree, you have. But who gave you the ability to earn it in the first place? Where did that come from? Who gave you the gifts to earn that money in the first place? Now, the point is, it's not your money. It's not your house. It's not your car. It's all his. Everything belongs to him. It's all a gift. Everything you have is a gift. Psalm 24 tells us this. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You know what the Hebrew word translated everything means? It means everything. Everything. In 1 Chronicles 29, King David, he's, he's been leading the people of Israel into giving generously towards the building of the future building of the, of the temple, the house of God. And he says, everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? I mean, he, just, he, he sees this as an absolute privilege that we get to give generously to build the house of the Lord. What a privilege. There's no hint of how much can I keep hold of. It's like, let's give all we possibly can. Let's give all we have to build the house of the Lord. And then he says, everything comes from you. We have given you only what comes from your hand. He recognizes it. They're not doing God a favor here. God is the source of all provision. They're not doing him a favor by lending him some money. I don't know if you've ever thought of it like that, you know, with the the offering in church or whatever, you think, yeah, I'll just give a little bit back to God. You're not giving anything back to God. It's his. It's already his. You're just simply doing what we're called to do. You're not doing God any favors with that. David understood it. He understood ownership. We've got to get it right. 
We've got to get ownership and stewardship the right way around. Because, the, because actually, if you read other parts of the Bible, it's quite sobering. This is quite challenging. There will be some challenging things that I say today because it's what we see in the Word. The sobering thing is that if we're not radically generous with money when God has commanded us to be, it's not just stinginess. It's not just lack of generosity. It's robbery. It's robbery because it's not yours. If the master gives you money and tells you what to do with it and you don't, it amounts to robbery. That's the language God uses in the Old Testament with with the people of Israel. In Malachi 3, a very well-known passage, often quoted when talking about this subject, talking about giving. Just to set the context, this is is in an Old Testament context. This is to the Israelites. This is post-exile Israel who have had this attritional thing of being in exile in Babylon, then they're back and they're establishing life again, but they're still not following the law. They're still not being obedient to God, and God is reprimanding them. He's rebuking them through the prophet Malachi. So that's the context of this. This isn't a direct application to us, but I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But, but this is what he says to Israel. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. And, but you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So there was a requirement in the Old Testament on the Israelites to tithe. That means give 10%. Tithe means 10%. To give away at least 10% of everything because it was tithes and offerings on top. So it was at least 10%. And it's a bit complicated because I think there were three different kinds of tithe. There was like a festival tithe. There 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 was the Levitical tithe. There were different kinds of tithe. But the point is this. God had been very clear with them, with the Israelites, in instructing them through the law how to use the resources he had given them. And when they didn't do it, he called it robbery. That's what God said. Now, how does that apply to us? Because like I said, this is in a different context. This is teaching into a very specific situation. Tithing isn't taught explicitly in the New Testament, like to believers in the church today. That's not explicitly taught. Um, And sometimes we just want a rule to follow, don't we? We sort of think, that'd be a lot easier, God, if you just told it, just give us a rule. We're good at following rules, some of us. Um, no, but tithing, it can be a really helpful guide. It is a biblical principle. It goes beyond the law. It goes before the law. Abraham gave 10% of everything he had to Melchizedek. right? So it's not just bound up with the law. It's a good principle. It's a good guide. And certainly it was helpful for me when I first was challenged about giving. And I started to think about this many years ago. And I thought, well, I don't know. What do I give? And I thought, well, there's this biblical principle of 10%. So I'm going to do that. I'll give 10%. And that was the starting point for me. So it's a really helpful guide, but it's not a rule. It's not a law. Because actually, when we just end up following rules, inevitably it leads to obligation. It leads to a heart of obligation. I give my tithe, so I'm generous. I give my tithe, but actually I can still lead a very comfortable life. And I'm fulfilling my obligation to God. Brilliant. Not brilliant. Because if that's how you see it, you've completely missed the point. If, that's how you, if you see giving as obligation, you totally missed it. And I would say, stop. Stop doing it. It's about joyful generosity. It's not about obligation. What if God wants you to give more? And you've just settled on this because it's like, and I feel good about myself. No, no, no. What if he wants you to give more? From the other side, maybe for you, 10% just seems too huge. It's too much. It's inconceivable. And so, again, you, you, don't end, you end up not giving anything because you can't get your head around what does it mean to give what do I, how much do I give? And you don't give anything. And I would say, if that's you, if you're part of this church and you're not giving anything financially, start. Just start. Give what you have faith for. You don't have to go for 10%. Just give what you have faith for and see what God does. And I guarantee he will do something in you. I guarantee he will bless you. Not to make you rich, but he will provide. We believe in a gospel of provision, not prosperity, but not a gospel of poverty either. Just start whatever you have faith for. Now, here are some principles I think the New Testament does teach us about giving and generosity without having the time to go to all the different passages. So first, give out of what you have. That's really important that you don't give in a way that is reckless, that gets you into debt. Now, there are times when God does ask you to take a step of faith. There are times where he might speak to you very clearly, and that's a matter of trust. That's between you and God. But don't give recklessly in a way that gets you into debt because that's not good stewardship. We're called to be wise stewards of what we have. But equally, to give a caveat to that, don't use wise stewardship as an excuse to not be generous. 
Okay, so give out what you have. Second, give first to God. First fruits, give before anything else goes out of your bank account. So if you get paid monthly or weekly, you have some sort of income coming in, give, give to God, give to the church first before anything else goes out. So you don't get into a situation where you've spent everything and then it's like, what have I got left? I think God deserves more than our leftovers. So third thing is to give regularly in proportion to your income. The New Testament teaches this, to give regularly in proportion to your income. That means there's a regular planned amount that you give, a regular planned amount that is proportional to your income. However much that is, however little, how much that is, that's between you and God, but there is a regular planned amount. And then the fourth thing is to give generously and sacrificially. Oh, this is where it starts to to get a little bit more uncomfortable. Look, even if you have a regular planned amount that you give, and it might be a really generous amount, be prepared to go way beyond that at any time. Be prepared to give over and above that at any time. Whenever you have the opportunity to be generous, whenever God calls you to be generous. And then the fifth thing is so important that we give with great joy and with no compulsion. See, this talking about this is not to make anybody feel compelled. If that's the effect, I, I'm sorry. That's not the aim. And if that is how you feel in your heart, then you need to take that to God and talk to him about it. This is not about compulsion. It's about joyful generosity. See, here's the thing. The New Testament standard is actually far higher than the Old Testament standard. We look at the Old Testament and think a tenth, offerings, wow, that, you know, they, were, they had to be really generous. New Testament standard is higher because it teaches joyful, sacrificial, radical generosity, which means there isn't a hard and fast rule to follow as much as sometimes we might like it. It's a heart issue. It's about our hearts and our relationship with God and our trust in God. And by the way, he sees your heart. I know there'll be people here who would love to be able to give more. You'd love to be able to be more generous with, with finances, but there are constraints in your life that are out of your control, which mean that you can't. God sees your heart. This isn't about condemnation. It's about your heart. And there are many ways that you will be showing your generosity in other ways as well. He sees your heart. But this is a response of worship. What we give is a response of worship to God. It's dying to the love of money. It's putting our trust and our faith in God to provide for us. Here's the key question, I think, in this whole area, is what is God asking you to do with the resources he's put in your hands? What is he asking you to do? Do you ever listen for him in this area? Do you ever listen to what he's saying? Do you ever ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, before you come to spend uh, a, a lot of money on something, for example, do you ask him if that's okay? You know, it's like, Lord, we really want to move house to a bigger house. We feel we need that. Do we have your permission to do that? Because it's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of resource to do that. Do we have your permission? Do we, are you happy with us using the money you've given us for this or for that? Just think again about the early church and their example. Radical example. Sharing everything, selling things. None of their possessions were their own. Made sure nobody among them was in need. They saw a need, they met it. They didn't wait for the church leaders to meet it. They didn't wait for somebody from outside to meet it. They met it themselves because this was their family. That's what they did. Just imagine you're in a situation where you have become aware of somebody in the church in need and you think, I'd love to be able to help them out. You know, there's an, If I could give them this, I could help them out. And then you realize... I can't though, because I've already spent that money on the, 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 the monthly repayments for the bigger, more powerful car I thought I needed. Or I've already spent the money on the new sofas because the old ones just didn't match our color scheme anymore and it was time for a change. You know, the early church solution to that problem would be sell your car and give the money to them. It would be sell your sofas and give the money to them. And we've gone very quiet now. It's challenging, isn't it? It's rad this is radical. This is, this is challenging for me. I'm not standing here as somebody who's got this. This is challenging, but it's what we see. It's what we see in the Word of God. It's what we see in the Bible. It's what we see Christians doing. Now, please don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean, of course, that you should never move house or you should never buy a car. Or you should never buy... So not that at all. That's not the point. Please don't take that point away from this. It's understanding and grasping that we are stewards of money that isn't ours and we have a responsibility to use it in line with the values and the wishes of the owner. It's moving from an, a heart attitude of how much do I have to give? How much can I get away with giving? To a completely different mindset and heart attitude of, Lord, this is what you've given me. How much do you want me to keep? 
how, much, how do you want me to live my life? And I'll give the rest away. It's a totally different mindset. What is he saying to you? What is he asking you to do? What's he asking you to give? He will not ask us to do things that are impossible. He will not ask you to do anything that is impossible, but he will ask you to do things that require faith and that require you to trust in his provision. God loves to put us in those places because we grow through it. And why wouldn't we trust in his provision? I mean, he's the God of the universe. He's powerful. He's the God of the Bible. That's what we believe in. Let me just share a quick example. I heard this just a couple of weeks ago from a, a, a preacher at an event I was at. Is a, a, a pastor from Manchester who many years ago when the Haiti earthquake happened, he went out. They had links out there. He went out to Haiti to visit and the church had, given, had raised and given him an amount of money to take out there to give to whoever he felt needed it. And so he had all these US dollars in a, a kind of wallet strapped to his side. And he went and visited a pastor out there who described the devastation, the homeless families, the food situation, and he just thought, well, this is it. I, I'm, I, he just felt stirred to give. And he said, well, look, our church has given this money, you know, faithfully, sacrificially. Please receive this as our blessing to you and as God's blessing to you. Use it for whatever you need it for. Then he went and visited another place and another pastor, and actually he said that the situation there was even worse. And he thought, I wish I hadn't given all of it. I wish I'd kept some back for this guy because this guy needs some money. He looks in the wallet and the wallet is full. It's filled up. So he says, well, okay, um, take this as God's blessing to you. This really is God's blessing to you. Do with it what you will to, to relieve the situation here. And he went to a third place and the same thing happened. He's talking to somebody, he's devastation. And he's like, oh, I wish I'd kept some of that money. And the, the wallet is filled up again. And he gives the money again. And he said when he got home, he's prayed over that wallet many times and it's, it's never filled up again. <laughs> Maybe there's a link to generosity here, you know, and God's blessing, link, link to generosity. But, but my point is like, well, why, 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 that's an amazing story, isn't it? But why should we be amazed by that? Because that's the God we serve. He's the God who created the universe. He's the God who can feed the 5,000 or probably more like 10, 15,000 with five loaves and two fish. When people give what they have generously, he multiplies it. He can do anything. Why would we not trust in his provision? He can provide for you, but it does take a step of faith often to know it and to experience it and to see it. Yes, we give out of what we have. Absolutely, we are to be wise stewards, but we also give sacrificially with radical generosity, trusting in God's provision. And we've been in that situation a few times in our lives of kind of like, how much, Lord? <laughs> uh, I tell, tell you, he isn't, he's always provided for us. We've never been without what we need. He's always provided for us when we've taken steps of faith. He's a good God. He's faithful. He's powerful. He's trustworthy. So we're to be stewards of money that isn't ours. That's the first thing that we see in the parable. Are you asking him what he wants you to do with the money you have? Second thing is to put your money into things that last. Put your money into things that last. The manager in the parable was commended for his shrewdness, for his foresight. What did he do? Well, in cutting out his commission, he limited his short-term gain, his short-term financial gain, and invested in something much, much better and far more valuable and long-lasting, which is relationships with other people. He invested in relationships. He understood in the long run, he was going to be far better to... to, to to not grab whatever money I can get my hands on right now, which will then run out, it just makes sense to put money into something longer lasting. And that's just sound investment, isn't it, for anybody? Put your money into things that are going to grow in value, not things that are going to depreciate quickly. Jesus is very clear. One day, all your money will be gone. So in verse 9, which I'll, I'll explain a bit further in a minute, but he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone... When it is gone, when your worldly wealth is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The reality is there is no safe investment in this world. There's, there's nothing material here that cannot fail. Nothing eventually will last. So we're to put money into eternal things. Well, what does that mean? Well, that line that I just said that Jesus used, it's quite confusing. He says, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Worldly wealth is your money, your possessions property, everything that we have here in this life that we will not be able to take there into the next life, into eternity. Now, one commentator says this about that verse. 
He says, although these things, meaning things associated with worldly wealth, although these things belong to this life only, says Jesus, yet what will happen to you then when you pass into that life will depend on what you do with them here and now, how we use what God has given us now. And then he says this, make sure that your use of them, your use of worldly resources, brings you into a fellowship of friends which will survive beyond death. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Let me explain that. Jesus knows what we need. He knows our hearts. He knows what makes us tick. We will look to the wrong things for our significance and for our security. So we will look to money very often for a sense of significance, either through boasting about what we have, showing off what we have, or by constantly wishing we had more. Or we'll look to money for security. But we know there's no security in money. It can be gone in an instant. There's no security in possessions. It's a false sense of security it brings us. It can be gone in an instant. Jesus knows We only truly find significance and security in relationships. It's in love that we find significance and security because that's what we were made for. We are inherently relational beings. Even the most introverted people, we're inherently relational beings because God is Father, Spirit, Son. God himself lives in relationship. He is relational. They live in eternal Uh, communion with one another, in eternal relationship, loving one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are made in his image. So we are relational as well. We need one another. We need people. We need relationships. We need love. That is where we find true fulfillment and true wealth, being surrounded by people you love and who love you. Bear with me here. This is going somewhere. Okay, there is a point that is going to come out of all this to do with money thing is we know even that even that sense of love is imperfect in this world it's imperfect in this life we know that love can be more a source of pain than fulfillment or pleasure in this life it's only in eternity that we will know that true wealth that we will really truly experience that true wealth so the 18th century american preacher jonathan edwards he preached a sermon called heaven is a world of love And in that sermon, he identified five barriers that we have here to love being that kind of fulfilling thing for us. Barriers that we have here that actually make love more a source of pain that we have here in this life, but barriers that will be removed in the next life, in eternity. So I'll just quickly run through those five things. First is, we all want to be loved for our own sake. It's really painful to... Um, feel that someone loves you and find out actually they're they're only loving you for what they can get. They're, They're kind of using you. I'm sure you've experienced that, and I'm sure you've probably dealt it out as well to somebody else. I remember a friend of mine when I was 10, 11, 12 sort of age, and he said to me, do you only want to come over to my house because I've got a Spectrum computer? And I was like, no, 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 no. And the reality was, of course, yep, yep. I didn't really like him very much, but he did have a Spectrum computer, and that was cool. And so I wanted to play the games. And so it's horrible, isn't it? But that's what we do sometimes. It's... it's kind of what we do. We want to be loved for our own sake. Here in this life, that doesn't always happen. But there, in the next life, in eternity, you will be fully loved, perfectly fully loved. Second thing is we want to be able to express love freely. But pride and selfishness, defensiveness, all sorts of things get in the way. You know, most days I find situations where I just didn't express my love for my family in the way I wanted to. And I think, why did I do that? Why did I act like that? Well, here in this life, there are barriers, but there, in eternity, we will love fully. Third thing is we want to love with complete mutuality, because there's great pain in loving someone who doesn't love you as much, or who doesn't love you back at all. But there, love will be perfect, and it will be perfectly mutual. Fourth thing, when we love someone, we can't stand them being unhappy. Someone once said, if you have children, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. And the reality is, whatever your situation, if you love people, your heart will always be broken. But there, it will be very different. And final thing is the pain of losing people you love. We've talked about that today. In this life, we will lose everybody, either through our own death or through the death of others. If you sit around the table with your family, one person at that table will experience losing everybody else. It's painful. But there, in eternity... It's love without parting. It's love without being brokenhearted. It's love with complete mutuality, fully expressed, fully, perfectly loved. The fact is the love that we need, every human being needs and craves and we were designed for, isn't here. It's there. 
It's there. It's in eternity. And so we invest money in eternal things. People who are made in the image of God, they are eternal. They're eternal. They last forever. Money doesn't. People last forever. The word of God lasts forever. And when we bring the word of God into connection with a person who doesn't know Jesus, who receives the gospel of Jesus Christ and gets born again, then they become brothers and sisters who you will never lose, who will eventually love you and you will love them perfectly and eternally. That's the fellowship of friends the commentator's talking about, the fellowship of friends that will survive beyond death. That's what we're all about, the church. It's why we're here. It's why we exist. It's about bringing people who are lost, lost broken people walking in darkness bringing them into connection with the word of God bringing them into connection with the love of God with the love of Jesus with the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing them healed saved set free for eternity put your money into that put your money into that put your money into the work of the kingdom that changes people forever for eternity you know we talk about people who are who are bound by addiction well we can say but there's freedom for you there is freedom, there is hope. People who are, who are homeless, people who are caught in sexual exploitation, there's freedom for you. There's hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who are lonely and isolated, people who are in debt, there's hope. If you're homeless, there's a home for you. If you're wealthy and you're relying on your wealth, no, don't do that. There's hope for you. There's great hope for you. Your life can be changed for eternity. Put your money into that. Send your money ahead. Just imagine if we all grasped hold of this. If we really grasp hold of this radical lifestyle of generosity that Jesus calls us to, just imagine if resources were not an issue for the mission, the lives that we could change through Jesus, the places that we could reach. I mean, just think, a dream I have for us as a church is to all the more be a conduit for God's blessing, by which I mean that we receive money given generously and we can give it away. Not just to use it for us, yes, we have to do that as well, but to be able to give more and more and more money away. So we're giving away more than we're using for our own, for our own things here. To be able to bless people, to be able to give to projects, to be able to bless places where we can see the kingdom of God extend through generosity. I want to be a part of that. Just think the places we could change, the people we could change, but also how we ourselves would be changed. By that, a community of people, a family of people whose hearts are so utterly and joyfully sold out for Jesus, living that adventure of generosity, living the adventure of following him, diverse church of thousands that truly surrounds and saturates High Wycombe with the love of Jesus and, he ex- and extends his kingdom to the ends of the very earth. That's a vision that I will give to. That's a vision I'll give my life for. That's a vision I will sacrifice for to see the kingdom of God extend. Radical generosity it is so challenging for our self-centered hearts. It is challenging, it's countercultural, and it's impossible apart from Jesus. And as the Apostle Paul encourages the church in Corinth to give generously to the offering for the poor in Jerusalem, what he says to them is, look, don't do this because I'm telling you. I'm not commanding you. Do it out of love and out of response to Jesus. And he says to them, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who gave everything. He was totally generous. He gave all his wealth to make us who are his enemies into his friends, into brothers and sisters who will be with him and will be with each other forever, for eternity. Focus on that. It's glorious. Fix your eyes on that. Fix your eyes on Jesus and use your money. Use the money that God has put into your hands in the light of the generosity and the grace and the love that you have received from Jesus. Let's be open-handed with whatever we have. Let us be a people that lives that adventure of radical generosity, lives the adventure of following Jesus, whatever the cost. Amen? Amen. Amen.